Hello, everyone. Welcome to Something to Talk About Live. My name is Liz Owen. I'm the Director of Communications here at PFLAG National. We're so happy to have you all with us. We have folks watching live on Facebook and YouTube, and we will be sharing your comments and questions. So please don't hesitate to put them in the comments and we'll bring them up as we get them. I'm really excited now to introduce my colleague, Jean Marie Nevetta, our Director of Learning and Inclusion. Welcome, Jean Marie. Thank you, Liz, and hello to everybody. Welcome to Something to Talk About Live. Um, if it's Thursday, it's Something to Talk About Live. I've also realized that if it's Thursday, it's the one day of a week I'm actually putting actual shoes on, so this is happening. Um, and I hope you're all also wearing real shoes. Um, today, we are going to be having a really interesting and timely discussion. Um, and in order to do that, um, I am going to bring in two of my colleagues and sort of get this kicked off. So. Um, with that, as uh, before we even introduce the um, article that we're going to talk about, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues, Sashelle Brooks and Sean Connor. And let's get them up on the screen. Hello, my friends. Um, Sashelle and Sean, do you both want to give a very quick introduction and then I'll talk a little bit about the article and we'll get moving? Sure, I'll go first. Um, my name is Sashelle Brooks. Um, I am the Southern Chapter Engagement Coordinator and I go by she, her, her pronouns and I'm based in Washington, D.C. currently. Great. And I am Sean Connors. I am the Chapter Engagement Coordinator for the Northern Region, uh, and I'm also based in D.C. Fantastic. So um, thank you both for joining me. I, I like seeing my D.C. colleagues from time to time. Um, so um, today we are talking about the article that is available online, which is entitled Queer Festivals, Drag Performances and LGBTQ Meetups Turn Digital. And that's from NBC News. And the author of this one was Julian Shen Barrow. Um, if you want to read the article and get the questions that we are about to discuss, um, you can click through on the PFLAG site or go to Straight for Equality. And on the homepage, we have links to our Something to Talk About series. Um, so um, the article really details how the rise of digital um, connections uh, at this time where we are all separated for good reason and for very healthy reasons. Um, and it talked about um, what is happening out there, how people are leveraging the internet um, to make connections in queer spaces at this time when we can't typically be together. And I have to admit that as I looked at the article and started to read it, it made me really excited to see what um, you know is being done, but it also made me think a little bit about the history of this. What a lot of people don't realize is that LGBTQ people have been using the internet in really innovative ways from the beginning to stay connected. Um, I, I was teasing my colleagues earlier and saying that because I'm 800 years ago, 800 years old, I remember things like dial-up internet and BBS groups. Um, and you know, when we look at the history of queer people engaging in these spaces, it actually dates back to the early 1980s. In fact, in 1983 was sort of the appearance of the first major, um, uh, it was specifically a gay online group. And then in 1995, lesbian.org launched. Um, we eventually saw things like gay.com and Planet Out, all of these different sites that help people connect, um, meet by community in some cases. Um, I was telling my colleagues that as a person who identifies as a femme lesbian, um, the butch femme space is not always physically acceptable to me. And those kind of outlets gave me a way to find community when I literally thought I was the only one like me. Um, I even found a reference looking at the history of this that referred to AOL as gayol. Um, because it actually was very quietly and rather subversively used for so much queer connecting um, at the time that that was the tool that most people were using. But today we have a whole lot more available to us and we are evolving what that looks like. So I want to start with the questions for discussion um, and ask my colleagues to start uh, talking to me. So my first question for everybody is, have you participated in any of these LGBTQ groups um, that are forming online to, to do these events that we have started seeing since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic? Um, and so if you have, what was it like? What was it? Um, did you enjoy it? And if not, why have you not participated yet? And whoever wants to jump in first should jump in. I can go ahead. Um, so I, I'm already pretty engaged online with LGBTQ communities, and I have been for since I was a teenager, but uh, really, really involved in some online gaming communities in the past decade or so. Um, so that's something that I've just continued to do and it hasn't really changed my life too much. But some of the things that I've been really excited about were um, I've attended a few story times with some of my um, my favorite LGBT children's publishers. And um, I also signed up to be a 
uh, a volunteer with Sage to connect with an LGBT elder um, by the phone a couple times a week. So it's a cool way to spend some downtime. Fantastic, Sashelle. I haven't joined as many events, but the one that I, I re recently attended was digitally was um, a local group um, had a drag digital bingo. And it was so nice because you were able to play bingo with people you would typically go and hang out with and interact and just like get lost for a little bit. Um, sometimes I, at the end of the day, I kind of want to unconnect, disconnect. And a lot of the times of when these events take place kind of hinder when I uh, tap into them. But when I do, I'm, I'm never really upset about it. It's like, it stimulates that social aspect. I kept sometimes feel like I'm missing, so. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point that there actually is a lot of this right now and that sometimes it actually is a matter of saying, you know, what can I do and where do I draw my digital limits? And that's sort of an important piece of it also, um, which I think is really um, kind of an interesting part of the conversation that we're actually going to get to before this is over. Um, I can honestly say that my connections have mostly happened with friends so far, a lot of whom who happen to be queer. But um, I have to say that this opportunity to talk to people once a week has become really the highlight of my week since this has started because it's made me realize um, these virtual spaces in many cases are pulling together parts of our lives that don't normally intersect. And as I look sometimes at participants on, on this and some of the other stuff PFLAG has been doing, I'm seeing um, people that I know from workplace training, people I know from the PFLAG chapter network, my mom. <laughs> um, so there's <laughs> kind of a lot of people who overlap in ways that I think never would normally happen, which I think is so exciting. So the second question that we threw out based on the article um, was this, it was that, you know, in your opinion, as everything is here, um, will these digital platforms and virtual spaces continue after distancing measures and stay at home orders end? So do you think they'll be around? And of course, um, the big question is why or why not? I'll go. I think there's going to be like a hybrid type of situation taking place. Um, what's really cool about these digital spaces that are popping up and um, t occurring is that you were able to connect with people who you, you typically wouldn't be able to connect and on um, the accessibility and the new audiences you can tap into. Um, it's thing when social distancing is no longer in place, it's not going to be exactly the same um, or we're not really sure what that new normal is going to look like. Um, smaller events are going to be able to have those in-person events and I'm going to see that, but it, I also would love to see more of having the live component to it so you're not isolating and that new audience you're developing and just really seeing that hybrid and see how it changes with different events and communities. Yeah, I totally agree. Sean, what do you think? Um, I think that, I mean, okay, so yes, I absolutely think some of these communities will still happen virtually and that's really cool for a whole host of reasons. We get to connect, I, I call it living in the future when I talk to sort of people who aren't online all the time. Um, <laughs> And I'm excited with people to to be able to like to see the value in these things that I've sort of seen the value in for a while. And I hope that I I have an increased opportunity to connect with folks as the, we move forward. Yeah, yeah. And can I just ask you? Um, because you know, I said I would prep all the questions, and now I've just decided on one that I didn't prep, which was so. Sean, you mentioned prior to this, you were pretty involved in stuff before. So, Shell, did you find that you engaged a lot online prior to our social distancing measures? I would say with aspects of um, my family is from the West Indies, so like um, connecting online through WhatsApp and like other apps. Um, I'm pretty comfortable there just because I'm not always traveling home. Um, so it's nice to have that face-to-face -face interaction. I love a FaceTime conversation more than I do a phone call. I tell people all the time, if you want me to answer, FaceTime me. <laughs> so. so true. It's so true. Except for when people call just after you got out of bed and you're like, don't, don't, this is not the real me. <laughs> so I, you know, I think it's 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 fascinating to think about what will happen to these communities. And I think one of the things that sort of everyone has acknowledged is we don't know exactly what this is going to be like when this is all over. And so I think that in the meantime, we have these really unique opportunities to try to build as much as we can and kind of show the value of this online community. As Sean, to your point, the I'm so excited that you're here and seeing it the way I see it too um, is kind of an exciting time for us especially for people who I think may have kind of poo-pooed the idea of online community as something that is very generationally locked in, which it is absolutely not after you start um, digging into stuff. 
So um, it was actually the third question. I need to tell people who are watching along today that fascinated me the most when we were doing our prep conversation about this which was I kind of expected to hear one answer and both of my colleagues had answers that I did not anticipate coming, which is exactly why I get excited about doing this event every single week. So the third question that we lined up for everybody, um, and please, if you are watching us today, I'd love to see you participate, give us some comments, give us some feedback, even just say hello. Um, the third question is, is there anything that concerns you about LGBTQ plus organizations and groups, you know, just community, uh, going viral. So what do you think the uh, members of the LGBTQ and ally community should do to alleviate those concerns? And so I'm turning it over to you both because you both had so much better answers than I did. So um, I I have to take a minute and just like acknowledge my privilege in that I am somebody who lives my life as an out like bisexual transgender man and I can do that at work because I work for PFLAG and I can do that in my personal life because I live in a big city and I have access to my communities um, and I it's something that I think about online particularly I'm sitting in my like my kitchen right now, my cat's at my feet. I feel really comfortable and at home and I know that maybe if someone is in their home and not thinking about who is looking into their into their home that they might not remember that oh that could be a stranger that could be someone who's not safe so for me I was like oh I think it's a really great opportunity for people to connect and I'm also I want to make sure that people feel empowered to moderate the spaces that they're in to make sure that they're safe for folks but that doesn't mean stepping back and being afraid of engaging online it just means being mindful of the choices that we're making yeah, you know, we've been doing some big work and PFLAG is going to be talking about this more in the next couple of weeks about bringing people together online. And I know that one of the biggest conversations that we set, we talked about was how to create safe spaces um, sort of operationally. So what kind of basic security procedures should you be having? But a huge part of that safe sense of safety is what you said, Sean, which is feeling comfortable in these spaces and making sure that they're being moderated safely. Because if anybody's ever been in a discussion that went off the rails, and most of us have been at this point, it can not just be an unpleasant experience, but it can quite literally scare people out of online spaces. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing. Um, Sachelle, talk to me about your feelings about what you think happens next um, and what your concerns are. Some of my concerns are like things I, I keep in considerations, like when you're looking at LGBTQ plus organizations um, going viral or going digital, digital um, the resources that it takes to, for them to get there. And, um, or like looking at look, looking at the digital drag bingo show I went to, all the behind the scenes that went into it, um, remembering to being able to tip them or to be able to um, give back to the organization that helped put the, the thing on in the first place. There's so much that goes into it, um, time, resources, money, and it's so easy for you to click on your computer screen and forget all of that, um, all the effort that went into it to make it happen. So I know like. It, where I can, where I can help by um, tipping virtually, or even if they need help with time, because I'm home and I have nothing else to do, I can help organizations in different ways. But I was more so looking at how things digitally, you don't see all the things on the back end that goes into things and reminding, remembering that. And a lot of like LGBTQ organizations budgets look differently and may not have the capacity. So like not forgetting that. Yeah, and I think that's, a, that, and as I was saying, you both had such fascinating points about what your answer to this question was, um, that it really made me think about it, that I think part of the immediacy of online interaction is that it feels like it's just happening. But you're right, what people don't see is the investment into the software to make it work and the prep time to make it work. And if people need to be paid for some of their stuff as they should be paid for their work, we shouldn't work for free, um, that there's a lot that happens and you see even less of that in an online environment because it literally, that environment is born the minute somebody hits go and it ends the minute somebody hits stop and all of the stuff behind the scenes is not visible. Um, this is that point where I remind people, if you'd like to donate to PFLAG, that's pflag.org. I'm totally aware of where I'm coming from here. Um, so, you know, I think as we talk about these online environments, one of the things that I um, definitely wanted to raise was um, the fact that one of the concerns that I think about is not everybody has access to the internet. I mean, we sort of see it as something that everyone has. We all pull out a phone and we immediately can get online. But the truth is that if we're going to talk about privilege, that actually is, in fact, a privilege. 
um, that there are a number of people um, for economic reasons, because of where they live, because of the technology that's available to them, that these spaces are completely, completely um, reliant on having access. And many people access through places like public libraries, many of which are closed right now. So as we look for ways to connect people, um, we can definitely catch a lot of people in these virtual spaces. We can bring people together in actual spaces. But what if people have access to neither of those? And, and, and will this um, will what is happening to us right now um, give us the opportunity to see where those people are and some and to raise some awareness around this? I know at PFLAG we talk about it a lot because our members are literally everywhere in every single state. And so anytime we're building anything online, we ask the question, what if they don't have access or what if they don't have good access? And so it's something that we are kind of part of our DNA here. Um, but I think we all need to do a much better job on that because just because you can pull out your phone doesn't mean everyone can. Um, and it's not just always... Um, you know, a technology, you know, an understanding technology thing. So um, I want to ask the the fourth invisible question, which I actually did prep people for. Um, and, and that was sort of your last advice that as we are looking at more of these virtual spaces, um, as we are building greater online community, um, what sort of takeaway, one last thing that you'd like people to keep in mind as part of this conversation, um, just before we go to some questions and comments um, from Liz and from people who are participating? Um, don't forget to unplug. I'm on my phone and my computer all day, and it's really easy to just move from my computer at the end of the day to watch TV or to get online. Get outside, be safe, but like unplug and be present with the folks who are with you. And if they're not with you, then take some time for yourself. Thank you. Mine's more about being finding balance. I know, like, um, Working for PFLAG National, it, it's a sudden set of my day is focusing on LGBT issues. Um, I make sure at the end of the day that I'm able to tap into my friends and other other aspects of my life, or even parts of the LGBT community. I feel like I'm not reaching in components, but just finding balance in what's missing and seeing how I can find it digitally or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or not. And I think that that's part of it, and remembering that. Hopefully, very soon, you know, within a few months, maybe we're all going to be at least physically together and in, in the ways mm -hmm. that look a little bit more like we're accustomed to and that there is life outside there. But I think from both of you, um, that theme of self care that being online, it, it can give you access to community, but it also just two other things, it, it can expose you to people who may not be super nice about that community. Um, and it can also kind of burn you out because that's a lot going on and constantly. Um, I know that for myself, I actually, uh, for a few months, took weekends off from Facebook and I discovered that they were the two happiest days of my life um, because I wasn't obsessing over what other people were doing. I was literally just looking at what was happening in my world and my relationships at those moments, um, but very happily got back online to reconnect with everybody on Monday morning. So I think there is really this balance. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about what is important to me during these times, I think one of the things is closing the technology gap. And in that case, I'm not just talking about um, making sure that people have access, but that's certainly necessary, but also making sure that people know how to use the technology. A lot of people are intimidated when you say, do a FaceTime with me, or let's connect on Zoom, or let's do a Google Hangout, or whatever um, software or platform you're using. Um, it seems very um, immediate to many of us, especially because many of us are using it for work. But some people, that is not necessarily the case. I mean, we certainly can say that there are differences in technology access generationally. Um, it also is very rooted in socioeconomics, too. So I would say if there are people in your life um, who maybe aren't super tech savvy, aren't Internet savvy, this could be a really great opportunity for you to say, hey, do you want me to set this up for you? I'll show you how to log on. I'll show you how to do this. I'll send you an invite and we can practice together. Um, and I think particularly at a time where we are having greater awareness of our LGBTQ elders, this could be great opportunities um, to connect with people and also really find how um, their stories can add so much to who we are and, and, and what we are doing now. And I, I really love the SAGE program um, that's going on. So if you're interested in that, you should definitely check out the SAGE website. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes remaining, um, and I actually want to see if Liz will come back into us and do some comments with us, and I'm sure you have stuff to add to it too, Liz. Oh, yes. I have to give a shout out to, so I grew up in New York City. Um, I grew up 
singing in gay bars from the time I was 13 years old, because as you do when you live in New York City. And uh, one of my absolute favorites, Marie's Crisis, which is down in the village, an amazing place. They've brought their all their folks online. They're playing music every night. And in a gig economy, they have each of them has tip bowls up, a digital tip bowl. And it's I want to really echo what Sachelle said. It's so important to support people in the gig economy right now. You know, if you honor them when you're there in person, honor them online too. I think that's such an important point. Um, go Marie's Crisis, I love you all. Um, so we've gotten some great comments uh, here. Um, and I'm gonna scroll up to find them. We had somebody who echoed your love of Sage earlier on. I'm gonna find them, hang on. We've gotten so many comments, um, let's see. Uh, Megan has been watching digital drag shows and it's not just people that they know on, uh, online, it's people they know in real life who they're now watching digitally, which is really cool. Um, oh, and here we go. We have Michelle. They're having an online virtual reunion town hall for Queer as Folk on May 1st. With She's all from Queer as Folk. Oh my gosh, this is Which so exciting. is so cool. And all the proceeds are going to our good friends at Centerlink. So that's pretty cool. And Michelle also echoed how much, how much they love Sage, which is really spectacular. Um, there's also, oh, we have someone, echo, Jamel, echoing my sentiments about the wonderful Marie's crisis. So. <laughs> Of course, I've got to bring that up. Um, then we have somebody asking about, this is a great question, about Spanish language groups, about, you know, supporting diverse communities virtually. Yeah, and there's so much of that starting to happen. I mean, a lot of it actually existed. So there are definitely groups that are doing this work. But um, in um, queer people of color spaces, we are seeing more and more support groups um, popping up for API communities, for Latinx communities, for African-American communities, um, and particularly for people who do not necessarily speak English. And that is one of the incredible ways that the internet gives us this access. So if that support group doesn't exist where you live, you're now suddenly able to log into some of these other groups. And I think we're gonna see a whole lot more of that starting to happen, particularly as people get more comfortable, I think, with some of these online tools. Absolutely. And then, of course, PFLAG chapters are showing up for a lot of people with meetings. Uh, Bobby says their chapter usually only has two meetings a month. Now they're going to one a week because people wow. really need that connection, stepping up in big ways. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, recognizing that sometimes the frequency of how much we connect might need to change a little bit. And I suspect that the longer that we go, and if we do, it's for the right reasons, um, mm -hmm. um, the more we're going to need to find ways to connect and find ways to connect in different ways. So, I mean, it's going to be the drag shows and the support groups and the just the hangout and the book group and things like this that don't need to be intense. I mean, we prepped this for 15 minutes today and now we're having our conversation. And our hope is that other people will do the exact same thing. It's it's that simple to feel connected. Absolutely. And then uh, someone who raised a really interesting point where that there were people who wanted to attend meetings in person and they couldn't. But now because their meetings have gone digital, have gone virtual, those people can now attend those meetings. So technology can absolutely undeniably be a barrier, but it can also you know, be a gateway for folks who want to attend a meeting but can't in person. Yeah. I did notice that there was somebody, there are a couple of people who have talked about challenges in online environments. And I think um, it's difficult. And if you've been up against it, you know that it can get tremendously ugly and really intimidating and make you want to run the other way. But I have to say, um, in some ways, the best version of revenge is starting your own thing and, do, and, and creating a community that you need. I mean, anyone who is sort of a person with an unusual interest, or in my case, a giant nerd, has discovered that communities pop up for everybody eventually, but somebody needs to take the first step. So I think if, if you've not found that space, I guarantee there's somebody else who also needs a space like yours. So there, it also creates opportunity for us. And I've put up a banner. There are a few folks asking where they can find a local chapter. So I've put that up here and it's scrolling. pflag.org slash find is the best way to find a chapter near you. Most of our chapters can be found on Facebook. Um, many of them are our on Twitter and Instagram. And if you have any trouble finding a chapter, you can reach us at info at pflag.org. We're happy to help you get in touch with someone who can help you locally. 
Absolutely. Um, and we have, and there's going to be a lot more stuff coming up from PFLAG. So um, definitely watch for what's coming out. Um, we have a lot of resources that are going to be unveiled and we're super excited about that. But also please remember to support um, LGBT organizations and frankly, any organization that is doing the programming that you are tapping into, even if it's only a little bit, every little bit counts right now, if you can. I recognize not everybody can. Do we have anything else out there, Liz, or um, should we start wrapping up? We do indeed. There's, hang on one second. I just passed a comment that I wanted to share. A few folks having their very first uh, virtual meetings. Um, this is really, this talks about that sort of, that cutting edge sword that the biggest issue of, you know, virtualism is the loneliness that many experience in lockdown. And of course, virtual only partially alleviates that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, particularly for people who are living in un unsupportive homes, unaccepting homes. It's a real yeah. challenge. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're really hoping that um, some of the things that we're doing and other organizations are doing will find ways to help people um, have those connections, especially when they are isolated. Um, and, and we know that we've definitely seen an uptick in people needing support. Absolutely. Environments. So one other one that I was going to bring up here, and I just have to, it's its all scrolling. It's just my, my life is scrolling. scrolling right now. It's a quality problem. It means a lot of people are interacting, which has been, uh, has been great. Um, oh, yeah. That was also the same concern for Roxanne about access to support for youth who are in difficult home situations. You know, I was talking, so I live in Burbank, California, Los Angeles area, our school board. Um, has done a, I have to shout them out, they've done a fantastic job setting up, you know, all these resources for students at home. And then they have an entire section on the Burbank Unified School District website just for LGBTQ plus students with a ton of resources and links they can access. I was talking yesterday, it turns out one of the intervention specialists at one of the middle schools also works with one of our, the P flag Burbank chapter. And he was talking about, yeah, he founded their GSA and he's the president of the P flag Burbank chapter. Um, and just talking about the many ways they're there showing up for their LGBTQ plus students. And they're such a great model for what's possible for a school district. And it'll be nice to see other districts following suit if they can. Yeah. I, I love the fact that you said it's a model for what's possible. And I think that this whole experience of sort of being forced to build online community um, really does give us models for what's possible. And um, hopefully um, we'll have an opportunity to kind of perfect them, although hopefully for not much longer. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we've only got about three minutes left, but I am gonna bring up this last uh, comment from Jamel because it relates back to the broadcast we did last week, which you can find on our Facebook page as well as on YouTube talking about LGBTQ plus movies, but it went kind of expanded beyond that. And there, there are so many artists and brands and community resources that are available and visible right now. So it's a great time to access those too. Absolutely, absolutely. And I do see that we had a question from somebody asking if this is being recorded and if you can access later, you absolutely can access later. Um, also, if you click, um, uh, if you're looking on Facebook, there is the link to the page with the something to talk about. Um, articles and questions. Um, so you can do this discussion at home with your friends. You could do it virtually if you like. If you're a P-flagger, use it for your program. If you're a workplace network group person, this is a great way to keep your ERG or VRG connected. So please take advantage of that. Thank you all so much. Uh, Jean Marie, I'm going to turn it over to you to close us out in that last two minutes. Thank you. Um, so Sean, Sachelle, thank you so much. Liz, thank you for once again uh, keeping everything on completely um, together um, as Sachelle was seeing people don't see what happens behind the scenes and it's because of Liz back there and so much of our team that these are able to happen. Um, so with that um, I really encourage everybody to definitely check out the article and the questions. Um, keep watching the PFLAG and Straight for Equality Facebook pages um, to find about what article we are going to be doing next week and see who's going to be joining for something to talk about. Um, have these conversations at home. Um, it's time that we start talking a little bit more. And I think not just virtually. Um, a lot of these conversations, these articles are great ways to get things um, 
get that discussion rolling, maybe the one that you haven't done before. So with that, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us again for something to talk about. We really, really, really look forward to seeing you again next week. Please tell a friend, please bring somebody along and watch with us and interact because your questions make this really great. And as we have been saying since we started this um, in the beginning, please be safe. Please be healthy, and more than anything, please be kind. My name is Jean Marie Nevetta. I'm from PFLAG National, and we are really grateful for you to, for everything that you're doing. Um, thank you, and have a great week.